Hi everyone, let's talk about early medieval Europe and Romanesque Europe. But let's start with some generalizations that will help us understand the time period better. What was life in medieval Europe like for most people? It's safe to say life was really hard. Uh, everything was quite unstable. The political situation was in a state of constant turmoil. Uh, alliances and territories were constantly changing. There wasn't any of the stability that we associate with ancient Rome or ancient Greece. There were many separate territories and they were ruled under the feudal system. This little diagram on the upper right explains the feudal system more or less. So roughly, uh, under the feudal system there is a king and below the king are the tenants in chief, his uh, royal advisors and people who served in his court. Below that are knights, also referred to as lords, whose job it was to protect everybody in the kingdom. And then below the order of knights were the peasants, and peasants were essentially slaves. In general, peasants were given a barely living wage. Uh, in many cases, they were given room and board in return for working the land. And it was their job to do all of the farming and then pay incredibly high taxes so that the king and the tenants and the knights could live off of the labor of the peasants. Plague and starvation were common. Um, if there was a bad year and the weather didn't allow crops to grow, then everyone was starving and uh, people who are starving are far more susceptible to disease. There were also barbarians, because not everyone agreed to live under the feudal system. So people that lived under um, the, in various territories under the rule of a king were living in constant threat of the attack of barbarians. So I've included a little photo of Conan the Barbarian, which isn't too far from the truth. And uh, the spread of Christianity homogenized some aspects of culture, unlike in ancient Rome most people were Christians the exceptions of course were the barbarians who in general continued to worship the pagan gods that were outlawed by Constantine and then on the lower left I've got a little clip art image of a knight <laughs> we're gonna begin by talking about the Vikings and the Vikings were the barbaric peoples of northern Europe which is referred to as Scandinavia and includes Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Iceland. The Vikings were sailors. Some of them were traders and craftsmen, but honestly most of them were pirates and warriors, and they made a living by raiding other countries. Norse mythology fascinates me, and it fascinates most of us since uh, we still feel its uh, after effects in popular culture, most notably in the recent superhero movies that feature Thor and Loki, who are traditional Norse gods. In Norse mythology, Odin is seen as the sort of father god and the most powerful god. He's the god of war, which makes sense since Vikings were very warfaring people and he was also the adoptive father of Loki and Thor. We have to Freya, and Freya was the goddess of love, and she's usually depicted riding a chariot that's pulled by cats. She also really likes apples, and it was believed by the Vikings that the end of the world was imminent, and it would be a time of Ragnarok, which is a, means a time of wind and wolves that would bring about the general doom and end of the world. I think that a uh, culture's general outlook on the world is often reflected in their religion, and the religion of the Vikings is very uh, violent, imaginative, and uh, powerful. There are lots of misconceptions about Vikings. For example, many of us believe that Vikings ran into battle wearing horned helmets, not true. Horned helmets were very impractical on the battlefield, so Vikings typically would wear very close-fitted metal helmets. Also, the myth about the quote-unquote Viking burial that was always uh, always took place at sea, 
and involved putting the dead body onto a ship and then setting the ship on fire as it sailed away is not necessarily true. As a matter of fact, most Viking royalty was placed in a ship at burial, but the ship was then buried and not burned. Therefore, there are many great examples of Viking ships and um, very lavish, expensive ornaments that the Vikings created because archaeologists have uncovered lots of Viking burials, and the best examples of them can be seen in the Viking Ship Museum, which is in Oslo, Norway. I've chosen this image here to have you guys look at because it's an excellent example of the Vikings' uh, wonderful ability to build ships. They specialized in building these kinds of boats which are very thin and sleek and could travel incredibly fast, faster than any ships that would have been on the sea at this time, and this allowed them to raid other countries very efficiently because they could just sail down faster than any of the other boats and faster than anyone um, so that when they arrived there wouldn't be time to give warning of their arrival and then they would arrive on shore and just wreck havoc, uh, completely raid other countries. The Vikings were excellent warriors so they uh, focused all of their cultural output in creating very efficient boats and weapons the Vikings did not leave behind a legacy of writing or of books because that's not what their culture was about. I think it's unfair to say that Viking art is only interested in warfare. We can see in, for example, the ornamentation of this boat, uh, they're interested with the natural world and these interlocking creatures are incredibly delicate and sensitive and beautiful. Um, however, the Vikings really didn't leave behind any books, and as a matter of fact, they were known for, when they first arrived, looking for the first church, entering the church, destroying it, and burning all books within, because they knew that this would really lower the morale of all the people that they were um, trying to raid. When I say that they would enter churches and burn books, the books that existed at this time were uh, incredibly rare and valuable because all books were painted and drawn and written by hand. And a book, another word for book is manuscript. Manu means hand and script means writ writing. And illumination is another term for drawing. So drawing and handwriting are the the two forms that were used to create books at this time. Books were typically written and drawn onto thin sheets of leather called vellum and then sewn together and hand bound. Here are two images from illuminated manuscripts from this time period and you can see that many of them were incredibly detailed. Only very, very wealthy people would be able to own a book. It would cost more than the equivalent of a brand new car today because it would take years and a team of people to create a book. Most books that we have that are, exist from this time period are religious in nature because they were preserved in monasteries and most of them were made by monks who would devote their entire lives to this. This is one page of an illuminated manuscript and this manuscript is called the Book of Kells. It's a mostly religious document and it's from Scotland. You can see when you look at it, it's um, very, very detailed. But I'd like to argue that, that some of this detailing and some of this uh, ornamentation has, uh, shows some of the legacy of the Vikings. Because look at the way it's detailed and then look at the kind of detailing that you see on this boat, I think there was certainly a cultural interchange here. Let's move forward and look at Carolingian art. Carolingian art is art that was produced under the rule of Charlemagne, and Charlemagne was the preeminent leader of this time period. He united much of Europe, which prior to his reign was in a complete state of chaos. He modeled himself after Constantine, the ancient Roman emperor, 
and he wanted to reunite and strengthen Europe uh, by focusing on Christianity and using the religion to bring everyone together. So under his rule, he reformed the church, he sponsored the arts, and he standardized written Latin so that religious texts could be standardized. This is a small image of him, and if you think about uh, ancient Roman artwork that you've looked at, you'll see that the way that he's depicted himself is similar to some depictions of ancient Roman emperors, because he wanted his, his, uh, the people that were under his reign to think of him as a Roman emperor. These are some examples of art that were made during this time period. You can see that they're very lavish and they're very Christian in their, their subject matter. The um, Lindau Gospels image on the upper left is actually the cover of a religious book. And on the right, this um, crucifix is one of the earliest examples of a life-size crucifix. It's hand-carved wood. And if you'll notice how Christ's belly has extended, this is actually because when people are crucified, a bloating of the stomach is one of the, the ways in which the, the pain of crucifixion was made visible because your bowels start to um, detach themselves from the rest of your muscles, which causes incredible bloat the realism and the level of emotionality in this artistic piece are relatively unknown before this time period. Then moving forward to Romanesque Europe, Romanesque artwork is referred to as Romanesque because it's in the style of the Romans. However, that's where any similarity to the ancient Rome Empire ends. And when I say it's similar to ancient Roman artwork, that's mostly because of the way that uh, buildings were constructed. A lot is owed um, in the architectural style of this time period to the, the vaulting and the concrete architecture that we see in ancient Rome. There was a boom in the creation of art during this time period because uh, leading up to the year 1000, people were very afraid that the end of the world would come. Much like people were freaked out when the year 2000 came because they thought that it would mark the beginning of an era or the end of an era. So up to the year 1000, artists and um, religious people were preaching the end of the world and encouraging people to be very mindful of what they did. And then when the year 1000 came and passed and nothing really happened, um, people were so thankful that the end of the world didn't come to pass that we see a proliferation of artwork that was made more or less as a sign of relief. Here are some Romanesque architectural terms that I'd like you to be familiar with. <clears throat> there are three main types of vaulting that we're going to look at. The barrel vault so-called because it looks like half of a beer barrel. The groin vault, it's called a groin vault because you'll notice that the different vaults all meet in the form of an X and anywhere where two things meet is called a groin. The rib vault is similar to a groin vault except that it's ribbed and we'll see in a picture that it often looks like it has actual ribs like bones running along it. And then I want you to be familiar also with what a buttress is. A buttress is an outside shape that reinforces the architecture of an upright building. Much of the architecture of this time period was built with stone, and stone is very heavy. And because it was um, considered admirable to build very tall cathedrals, Buttresses were often added to the cathedrals of this time period so that they could be supported and the cathedrals could be taller than ever was before possible. So take a look at these images. I want you to try in your head to label each of them. And then I'll tell you what the answer is. So this one here, it looks like half of a beer barrel so it's a barrel vault. This one, you can see that there are essentially four sections of barrel vault that are all meeting together. 
So it's a groin vault. This is similar to the groin vault. However, you can see what look like bones, ribs running along them. So this is a ribbed vault. And then here we have an image of a buttress. So this is a cathedral that has been buttressed from the outside very clearly. You can see how that supports the structure of the cathedral. I've included some images here of a Romanesque cathedral. Uh, most of the time, people of this time period would have had almost no access to education. Only very, very wealthy people could read. Uh, but it was true that almost everyone would visit a cathedral at least once in their lives. And the cathedral would, for most people, be the tallest building that they would ever see. Imagine the experience of never having seen a building as large as this cathedral and then walking below its doors and seeing images carved on it, such as this here. This is, this is a lintel carving. So this is the lintel right here. And above it, this shape is called the tympanum. And these are called the jams, this part of the door. These parts of the door were always covered with elaborate carvings that told in most cases scary stories that would intimidate people entering the cathedral. This is an image of hell. It was also believed that hell was a very very physically real place and that somewhere on earth there was a hell mouth that might have looked something like this and if you were damned upon your death you would be shoved into the hell mouth. This would have been incredibly impressive for people of this time period. And I think you could define the architecture of the Romanesque as an architecture of intimidation. It was meant to inspire awe and fear into visitors. Pilgrimages were very common during this time period and many people would undertake them. Essentially anybody who had the means to travel for a few months out of their life would do so in order to walk to a church. Uh, a pilgrimage is just a journey to any holy place, but during this time period most pilgrimages terminated at a specific church. So people would often make promises to saints and then go to churches that were sacred to them and give offering of some type. Most churches contained uh, reliquaries, and a reliquary is a container for holding a relic, and a relic is any item that's associated with a holy figure. Oftentimes this was a body part that was, uh, a whole, that was part of the saint, or maybe um, some of the saint's clothing, or any objects that are associated with a, a holy figure. Uh, here I have uh, one of the more dramatic examples. This is the actual hand of a person who is believed to be a saint. Other times the reliquaries will be a little more stylized like this one, but they'll often contain a bit of the saint's hair or their teeth or a bone, and people will come and make offerings to the relic. This is an image from an illuminated manuscript that shows a pilgrim being offered a little object of food by somebody who's not undertaking a pilgrimage. Pilgrims would often wear distinctive clothing and it was considered to be a good practice to give pilgrims money, food, and shelter um, because what they were doing was undertaking a, a, a holy walk. This is one of my favorite reliquaries. It's a statue of Saint Foy and she was a young girl who refused to denounce her religion uh, under the Roman Empire when Christianity was still outlawed and so they killed her. <clears throat> Here is an image of her being killed. Her body was buried and um, then it was later unburied and her skull was placed inside of a reliquary. Now many uh, uh, Critics of the church at this time argued that this practice of creating reliquaries was anti-Christian because it encouraged people to worship images and objects more than the idea of an eternal and unchanging God. 
And finally, we end with this image here. This is one of my favorite objects. These are both small details of the Bayou Tapestry. The tapestry itself is really, really long. It's 229 feet long, and it's just a little more than a foot and a half tall. It unrolls, and you could read it kind of like a comic book or a newspaper. It tells the story of the Battle of Hastings, and it tells the story in great detail. So it begins far before any battle takes place with uh, the various armies mobilizing themselves and um, readying their horses, going over the water, and then finally uh, battle scenes. But interspersed in all of it are, are funny little images along the margins that have no real explanations or uh, other sort of like hilarious um, little details like this is the hand of God emerging from heaven um, and the writing here uh, explains the imagery all of the artists who made this are completely anonymous and where it was originally hung and what its original purpose was is also mysterious but I think it's interesting as one of the first examples we have of an artwork that truly commemorates contemporary, at the time, events um, and is still so incredibly relatable. It is also referred to as a tapestry. Um, that's kind of a misnomer because a tapestry is, is a piece of art that's made of woven fabric and the Bayou Tapestry is made on fabric, but technically it's an embroidery. And that is the end of today's lecture.